Welcome back everybody. Here we are with another part of my top 50. Some really important games to me, games 20 to 11 here. And as I start talking about some of these, I'm going to be mentioning how Once Upon a Time, this game was in my top 10. Honestly, once we crossed into the top 25, a lot of the games became interchangeable with each other on different parts of the list. For example, Super Mario Bros. 3, which I always have a reason to bring up. That's one of my favorite games from childhood, still a favorite game from today. And for a long time, that was actually in my top 10 as well. I just think it's a beautifully crafted game with all of the secrets and all the costumes. And of course, there's the sentimental value there too. Now, I think this is part four of the top 50. And one thing that you may have noticed is the constantly changing backdrop where I'm shooting these videos. I'm just always looking for better lighting, uh, better pickup on the sound. Where can I actually put my camera so that it's not with a distracting background or something that cheapens the look of the video, which I find my computer space, as much as I love the green room for myself, not exactly the best on camera. And it looks like there's some serious staging going on, but I'm in my kitchen. I've done videos here before. It just so happens that between those videos and now, a plant has appeared. I didn't intentionally put it for the video, although it does help kind of balance the shot out. Anywho, that's stuff that I worry about more in my head than I think anyone in my audience actually does. With all of that rambling out of the way, we can finally get going with the games, and the first one to make its appearance today is Final Fantasy Tactics A2 Grimoire of the Rift. Now, I was a little bit torn. Am I going to go with Final Fantasy Tactics, the first one for the GBA, which I love and I have the most memories with, the characters are more memorable to me, or am I going to go with A2, which is on the DS and it has a lot of quality of life improvements, the systems have been ameliorated, the game just plays a lot smoother than its uh, predecessor. I went with the newer one, I went with the sequel, just because of how it plays. Now the first one, if you want a better story or a little bit more serious tone to it, yes, it's about children being whisked away to a fantasy world, but still, the way that it's delivered and a lot of the dialogue makes it seem a little more serious. It's kind of like they were finding themselves when they made a cartoony tactics game, whereas the first one on the PlayStation was super serious, right? It's a dramatic war story with a lot of politics. This one specifically, A2 on the DS, it has its moments, it tries to do a little bit of everything, but I think it delivers a little more on the humor, a little more on the immature side, which is not a bad thing. It doesn't try to be too serious, and some of the immature writing, some of the jokes are actually pretty funny. Your main character here, you can name him after yourself, uh, so go ahead and self-insert if you want to. My biggest problem with him is the goofy outfit that he wears. And you might think that that's a really silly thing, I'm splitting hairs between choosing Advance and A2. But hey, when the games are both so evenly matched, <laughs> little things like that really matter. And you're looking at your character for a long time during the game, so yeah, I don't want a goofy outfit. But another thing that really matters about A2 are the recruitable characters, and you're gonna be recruiting a lot of really interesting characters from past games. Characters from Final Fantasy XII are gonna make an appearance as they share the same game world. There's these different tasks related to your clan here. I've talked about this kind of side quest thing before, where you send characters out from your party, after a set amount of time they return, they've either passed the quest or they haven't, when they pass it they have rewards. Like I said, it's in Pokemon Sword, which was one of my very early videos and I was experimenting with reviews. I've talked about it I think when I talked about this particular game in the past as well. So yeah, if any of you know what that's called, uh, this little mechanic that's in a lot of these RPGs, please let me know. I think it's even in WoW of all games. Now I realize I'm not actually talking too much about the game here, and I think that is because I am still split on the Advance game versus the DS game. The Advance game, like I said, it really is more memorable. Also when I played it, I distinctly recall getting that game as a cartridge from my sister. She was working at a video store and when they were closing, she luckily got given some games. I guess she said she had a little brother who played games. I got the Minish Cap. I got Advance, uh, Tactics Advance, and I also got Madden Street or NFL Street, which is a fun football game for Xbox. I actually really enjoyed that. This game, I really just played it because it was the sequel and because I enjoyed the first game so much. But as far as what actually happens in the game, I've got no idea. The story from the first one is also more memorable. The story in the second is much of the same, but like I said, I think with less of that serious tone. 
So that's pretty much it for Final Fantasy Tactics. Uh, I don't mean to do it a disservice the way I'm speaking about it a little bit nonchalantly. I don't really seem to attach to it, but I am. I love the two games as a whole, I suppose, as a duology, but I can't pick both. I have to pick one. So my pick is A2 for the improved mechanics, the improved systems after the first game. Now, if any of you have only played Final Fantasy Tactics, the original, either for PlayStation or War of the Lions for the PSP, and maybe you were considering wanting to play more tactics, but you thought, uh, it's cartoony, it looks a little kiddy, it's not for me. I can promise you that's not the case. Uh, maybe you've experienced similar trepidation when you were fans of Zelda and then Wind Waker was coming out and you thought, oh no, no, that cell shaded, that cartoony look, I'm not gonna touch that. Look, I think enough time has passed. We all know Wind Waker is a good game. And I'm here to tell you, I liked Final Fantasy Tactics, but these two here, this duology, these are my favorite games in the series. So you gotta play them. Game number 19, Final Fantasy V. Finally, talking about some Final Fantasy and we got two in a row. We've got a little side series, a spin-off series if you wanna call it that, and we got the main line now. I was gonna say Final Fantasy V is the first one in the 2D games that really gripped me, but that's not true at all. I love Final Fantasy I. I enjoyed it on the NES when I barely knew how to play it and I thought Garland was the final boss. <laughs> I was a kid, what do you want? And uh, then when I replayed the games on the GBA, started getting those for Christmas as they were being released. I got Dawn of Souls, which contained one of two. I love those games. Final Fantasy II gets way too much hate. I do not appreciate that at all because it's a really solid game, also with some fun mechanics as far as leveling up goes. Final Fantasy III on the DS was a really odd one that missed for me. And then we have 4, and I think a lot of people enjoy 4 with Cecil, and it starts to really bring in a more serious and a more just kind of mature storyline, more emphasis on doing good storytelling. But we have 5, and 5 for me is just the perfect gameplay. 5 has the job system, which I love in most games. In this specific case, the way it works is as you progress through the game and you do events related to these crystals, of course Final Fantasy and crystals, they're not going to go away from that just yet, you unlock different jobs at a time. So in this first phase of the game, you've got your basic jobs, plus Blue Mage, which is a nice addition, and the Freelancer. So if you're used to Final Fantasy 1, where you have six jobs to choose from at the start of the game, this one just gives you a couple more to start out with, and there are so many more that you unlock as you play. I think another reason why I really love 5 is because, like Final Fantasy 1, you get to name your characters again, so if you want, go ahead and self-insert. First time I played it, I didn't bother keeping the main character's name, who's Bartz, by the way. I kept him for this little playthrough here, but I named him after myself. So there I am, I'm the main character in my adventure, and Lena joins my party, Ferris joins my party. It's uh, It was a pretty fun time as a teenager. <laughs> I think you guys can see that I'd be the kind of person who when I play a Western RPG as well, or an MMO or whatever, I like to design myself in the game. Uh, usually I won't play a really extreme fantasy race or something like that until my second playthrough of the game. So it's always me. I want to be in the game. I want to be the one experiencing it. I answer questions the way that, you know, I would answer them in real life. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Final Fantasy V doesn't have a lot of that stuff implemented. It's a very basic, or I shouldn't call it basic, because again, the job system that's implemented is expertly done. It's not basic, but it's simplistic, and it's in its simplicity where it excels. I couldn't remember a lot about the dialogue, actually I couldn't remember a lot about the story either, because it had been so long since I played it, but the dialogue is surprisingly funny. I think there's a lot of charm to it. The way that the characters interact with each other is great. You're not gonna dislike anyone in your party, even though some of them might start off a little bit gruff or a little bit cold, maybe even aloof. Everyone warms up to you and everyone bonds together because of the experiences that they share, starting out fairly early in the game. So that's nice. It really starts out where you care about your party members because they're experiencing something that they have to overcome. I think again, like the last game, I'll try to keep this one a little bit short. <laughs> I don't even know what short means in this case because I don't have a time or a clock in front of me. But I won't spend too much time talking about a Final Fantasy game because a lot of you already know what this game has. I just want to convey that this is one of my favorite games of all time. This is one of, if not the favorite fan Final Fantasy game for me. Uh, one of the best ones certainly, but I don't want to spoil anything in case we might see more Final Fantasy coming up. Just know that Final Fantasy V Fantastic game. I love it. I like the characters. I like the job system and in my opinion It hasn't been replicated quite as well in future titles 
Two games in, eight more to go, and I'm saying that because I'm really struggling here. <laughs> I got sick about a week ago. I don't know how I'm still sick, but I'm doing this with uh, brain fog. I'm doing this with some congestion. Hope the video sounds okay so far. If you notice, I sound a little bit different. That's why. I'm trying my best, and at least any mistakes I make can be blamed on the cold. Now, game number 18, Custom Robo, and this is a really special game to me. As a kid, I rented this out and I played it with a buddy of mine. That buddy of mine has been mentioned before. He's gonna be mentioned again because we played a lot of games together, especially as a kid and as a young teen. And Custom Robo was one of them. And I bought this in university off of eBay just because I was thinking back to some of my favorite games and I really wanted to replay this. And I think at the time, maybe Dolphin wasn't as sophisticated. So I had to own it. <laughs> And it really is a fantastic game. I've talked about it before with the underrated games videos, but I don't think anyone realized just how highly I valued this game. And yeah, here it is at number 18. It's been top 10 before, it can be top 15. Like I said, these go up and down all the time. Custom Robo for me is a game that still has not been matched. I'm sure there are games out there that have similar gameplay and if they exist and you know of them, then let me know because I would love to try them. Custom Robo with its customization, that's what it's all about. It's just almost limitless customization. You've got five or six different parts on your Robo that you can change out. And as you play the game, you progress through it from beginning to end. You're gonna be getting so many parts that you can put in there. It's something like 10 to 20 per slot. So do the math. The gameplay is really fast. It's action oriented based in a small arena. You've got different missiles, different lasers, you've got a dash attack, you've got different heights that you can go to. The levels themselves are gonna have obstacles in them, so there's a little bit of that sometimes where you're fighting the environment as much as you are your enemy. You can have team battles, and I remember we used to play this as well. 2v2, even some one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, it was always more fun playing against the computer together, I thought. I've also mentioned this point before, where you guys are going to get a kick out of the dialogue. Some of the characters are really funny, and the lines actually really deliver. They're not cringeworthy. And I'm a very harsh judge of comedy and of humor. And maybe I'm just a little bit too stuck up, too much of a curmudgeon, but these guys actually make me laugh in the game. Good stuff. Aha! And as I pay more attention to the back of the case, I see that they advertise 50 plus guns, 30 plus bombs. So you have a gun on one arm and you have a bomb on the other. 15 plus legs, and the legs have things like your boosters, your double jump, and all of that kind of stuff. They increase the damage or the length of your dash too. 30 plus pods, and pods are basically these shoulder pieces. Pods can be similar to the bombs that you have on your left arm. Sometimes they're gonna be homing in on your enemy. Sometimes they're just gonna be sitting there like proximity mines, and as the enemy comes forward, uh, they might chase them or they might blow up and catch them in their radius. So there's a lot to try, so many different play styles. Ah, I think that's what I should emphasize. Because there's so much customization, yes, it's a small little arena shooter, arena action game, but there are many different play styles available. That's what I like about it, because as you play from beginning to end, some might say that the battles are a little bit repetitive or there's so many battles, but not if you're changing your play style, not if you're constantly customizing your robo and trying different things in the game. Like Pokemon, for example. Yeah, you can use the same starter your whole way through and that might be a little repetitive, a little boring, or you could try grass types and water types and different Pokemon in there, even different play styles with the Pokemon. Same thing here, you could try different play styles with your robots. Game number 17, another one where I had to choose between the older game and the newer current game, and that is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. What was I gonna choose in its place? Melee. Now, is Super Smash Bros. Ultimate the better game? By far. But what did Melee have that actually had me hung up on it? Aside from the memories and aside from the LAN parties, and yes, Melee was actually a game that we had LAN parties for, and this was well before I knew that competitive Melee was a thing. Uh, good for that game, still going, I suppose, but certainly doesn't really matter to me. Melee had the trophies. Do you remember that? When you would unlock different trophies and they would come out of the gumball machine kind of aesthetic? That was the presentation for them. I loved that. So you'd open it up, a little trophy would fall onto the table, and you could read about the game where that character came from. It would say when the game was released in Japan, when it debuted in North America. All the little details there, I read each and every one. I hope I unlocked everything. I should get my GameCube plugged in and see how that's going. But what does Super Smash Bros. Ultimate have? 
everything. Honestly, it has everything. Except for that little gumball machine uh, toy trophy presentation, it has everything else. The characters in the roster here, massive. I've spent probably 50 hours playing Smash, and a lot of that is just the single player mode, and I still haven't tried every character in the game. And I would like to with a game like that. I would like to play every character once. In Melee, I had every character up to at least a decent level. But there's just so many characters in Ultimate and there's so much stuff you can do in the game, even single player, I haven't gotten around to playing every character yet. I'm also putting this game this high in my list despite not buying the DLC. I don't need the DLC because I don't play online. If my friends are coming over, there's one who has the DLC and he'll bring his Switch so we can play the extra characters over there. Like I said, this game just has so much, even as a base game. Uh, once upon a time, I wanted to do a video where which games give you the most bang for your buck, which are the most valuable games. I was going to focus on the Switch especially. Hyrule Warriors was going to be there. A Pokemon game was going to be there. And Ultimate, of course, has to be there. I think anyone who's played this game knows that. Now, do I need to explain how Smash works to anybody? I don't think so. When Melee was on my list, it wasn't actually this high. It wasn't in the top 20s. Uh, because I hadn't replayed Melee in so long, because Melee really was just left behind in the past when we were doing those land parties in high school and junior high. But Ultimate has brought it forward. Ultimate has brought it up in my list. The more modern game, the relevant game right now for most people. And it's the one that, like I alluded to, if my friends are getting together now. Usually it's easy to throw on. We'll play a few rounds of that while we just catch up with each other. I just want to make one recommendation before I get off this game. In case you've held off on buying this because maybe you think, well, it's not worth it for me. I don't have other people to play with, I'm not going to get online, I'm not going to play it there. It is still an amazing first player or single player game. <laughs> first player, whatever. It's an amazing single player game. If you're familiar with Melee's uh, single player mode and Brawl's single player mode, how it takes you through a gauntlet of enemies and then at the end there's Master Hand or something like that, there's that in this game as well. It's called Classic Mode and that's varied slightly depending on which character you play. So for example, if you pick a Fire Emblem character, the theme of your route is different than if you were to pick a Pokemon character. What I really love, and what I'm still not done playing, I've been playing it on hard, so some battles really take a lot of attempts, is the Adventure Mode. The Adventure Mode has so much content. It's basically this sprawling board game, so to speak, and as you go to these different steps in the board, these different panels, you have different battles, you can unlock different characters, they'll gradually join your party and fill up your roster, you can do some special things on the board, like let's say for example, you get a bomb character from the Kirby series, that might unlock another area where there was a destructible rock. So the way that the board unfolds and the way that you progress through your adventure here is great, very creative, uh, fantastic if you don't have anyone else to play the game with, and if you do, the game is only going to be that much more valuable. Game 16, so the last one that just did not make the cutoff for top 15. I do think the top 15 games are a little bit more precious, but this is a beloved game. If you've watched the channel before, then you know how much I love this game. It's been pointed out to me how much I love my puzzle games, and I was realizing that as I was making videos for this channel, but uh, anywho, Pokemon Puzzle League. If you like games like Tetris, Tetris Attack, that's what this is. If you like competing against other people in Puyo Puyo Pop and those kinds of games, this is better. In my opinion, this is the, as good as it gets. This hasn't been surpassed. So I still go back to this game and I play it from time to time. It is great to play with other people. It's great to play on your own. This game in particular has a lot of different game modes and a lot of different challenges you can do. There are these other puzzles presented here, which are basically just, you know, little logic games. Try to solve this configuration in two or three moves. They're also available on a 3D board, which wraps around your entire playing field. That's really interesting as well. And by the way, is there a distinction between different kinds of puzzle games? Is there a term specifically for these really fast-paced puzzle games? If there is, I can't believe I don't know it. And it's not like I'm some video game newbie or anything. I hope you guys understand. I've been gaming my whole life. It's been my number one priority and hobby my whole life. That question has only popped in my head now though. Anyway, moving on with the gameplay and talking about the game. Yeah, this is one that like Pokemon Stadium, it was a staple on the N64 for us. It was one that the family could all play together or watch each other play. As I got hooked on the game and I played it more and more and certainly more than anybody else, 
I quickly became the best player in my family. And in this footage on screen right now, no, I'm not the best player, but I'm so rusty and it really does take a long time to get your groove going with this kind of game. I've spoken before with certain Mario games, how when they do a good job with the Mario flair and the aesthetic, how if you're a fan of that series and you're gonna have a really good time with it, even if it's not a mainline game. And the same thing is true here with Pokemon Puzzle League. Uh, you know, you've got Mystery Dungeon, you've got all kinds of different games that are spin-offs from the main series. This one fits right in with the world. It's presented very intelligently. They make it super simple. So Ash is called up by Professor Oak to go do this challenge. And the Pokemon League is playing puzzles instead of having these battles. It's great. It gets the job done. And then when you go to battle and you pick your Pokemon from this little roster of three, that is obviously where the fun begins, but it goes to another level. As you're doing these combos, as you're getting really high up there, three times, four times, five times, six times, your combos can get nutty. I've been in double digit combos before, the AI has been in double digit combos against me. Your Pokemon gets this really distorted cry and it gets repeated every couple of seconds, cutting off the audio that plays before it. I'll try to find a sample from my gameplay and put that on screen for you. If not, just go look it up on YouTube, somebody who plays this game better than I do, and you can hear what I'm talking about. It's hilarious. When you're in a battle and the AI is dropping out on your head, it's scary as anything. But there's a trick. The better the computer is, the easier the game might be, because you can use their big block against them. If you create a match touching that block, there's a delay. And the delay is that that block is being destroyed as a very long, gradual snake. You have time to set up your tiles underneath in little sets of two so that when the big block breaks and the tiles fall from there, they'll land and you'll have combos that way. So, Pokemon Puzzle League, another game that's been in my top 10, that's been in my top 15 before, but when I was really scrutinizing the list and thinking about what games have the most to offer, how my memories stack up against the gameplay, it just barely fell out. But still a phenomenal game, one of my favorites of all time, and a game that I will certainly be playing more over the years. Okay, here we go with the top 15. I've got this wide grin on my face. Every time I've thought about presenting the top 15 games, it just made me smile randomly throughout the day because these games, I've said it about so many already, but these games are really special to me, either because they are outstanding games that have just impressed me like no other, or the stories that I have to share are so, well, precious to me, like I just said. Whoops, getting a little redundant with my words here. But coming in at 15 to start this real elite class of games is Metroid Prime. And I didn't just slot this in because the remastered coming out. No, actually the remastered is out, just not physical yet. Metroid Prime is and always has been one of my favorite games ever. This is the best in the Prime trilogy. Soon we're gonna have a fourth game, but uh, we'll see how that one does. Metroid Prime just delivered on novelty, first of all, it was the first to do so many things and it did them among the best. I'm talking about the environments that it presented, I'll get into more detail later. But just, I didn't know what to expect. And it's not like I was one of those 2D Metroid players with Super Metroid or anything like that, no. This was actually my first Metroid game, we didn't have it on the NES either. And I've mentioned before, we did not own the SNES, my cousin, my uncle did. And speaking of that uncle, it was actually at that uncle's place and watching him play Metroid Prime that I fell in love with the game. Now, for whatever reason, this didn't ruin the experience for me, but I saw him playing the final boss there, so I already knew what was to come, but it didn't matter. I watched him try attempt after attempt until he beat the final boss and he beat the game, and I just knew I had to get Metroid, I had to play it. For those of you wondering, with the remastered, is it worth it? And from what I've seen so far, it absolutely is. The changes that they make to the remastered, just cleaning up the visuals, but also adding some details in the environments. For example, if you go look at, I think it's uh, GameSpot's comparison video. Someone did a, a nice comparison, GameSpot, IGN, one of those companies. When you play the GameCube version, you are fully immersed in those environments. You are exploring this world, Talon, something that you've never seen before, so alien and yet so lush and eerily quiet as well. And that is related to the story, which I'm only picking up now as I'm replaying it as an adult. <laughs> when I played the game for the first time, I didn't really care too much about the story. I was just immersed in the world and I love the gameplay. I just want to make this point really clear. If you can only get your hands on the GameCube version, 
if you don't have a Switch or if you just want to pirate the game. Whoops, I said that word. There's space pirates in the game. That's what I'm talking about, though. Space pirates in the game. And if you want to uh, space pirate the GameCube version, maybe that's the easiest way for you to play the game. Again, you are not going to be lacking or wanting for anything because the GameCube delivers and still holds up today. Anyways, let's move on. What I remember the most clearly about playing Metroid Prime, oh god, actually I say that as if there's one thing, and one thing was in mind, but as soon as those words leave my mouth, I'm remembering all kinds of different parts of the game. The first thing I was thinking of was scanning the environment. And what I remembered was scanning to complete the logbook, and yes, there's a little bit of lore on all the different things that you can scan. What I did not remember, and what I, rem uh, what I rediscovered when I replayed the game, is that you can even scan things that will not appear in your logbook, and they just add so much flavor and information, and just enhance the experience as you're exploring this world and you're learning about it. The fauna, the flora, all kinds of things, even just some of the mechanical and the computer surfaces, they don't get entered in your logbook as a collectible. That's what the logbook is. It's a collection of sorts, and that's how you have your 100% completion rate at the end of the game, or not. These are just little things that you can pick up on and you could read about. You get to hear about how the scientists were working on something, how the space pirates were studying some specimen. It's amazing how much there is in this game that one, in my opinion, doesn't detract from the gameplay, because you don't have to scan everything. And also, once you scan something, the little scanning icon will dim to a very faded orange. Doesn't detract from the gameplay, but boy does it enrich the entire game as a whole. For those of you who don't know Metroid, this isn't meant to be a little spoiler, but one of the really fun things about these games is the different parts that you can get. Samus's gun can have different elemental beams. I've always loved that. So I don't know how they change from game to game, but you might have something like a fire beam or a plasma beam. You might have an ice beam that can be used to freeze enemies. Actually, that's in the very first game, the NES one, you have an ice beam. So there's so much there with the weapons and the way that you can enhance your gameplay that way. There's the grappling hook, which is called the grapple beam, I think. Of course, if you've played Smash, then you've seen Samus curl up into a little ball before. That's the morph ball. And the morph ball segments in this game are so much fun. I remember there are basically little puzzles within the game. Metroid is very much an action adventure, but it also has environmental puzzles. And when you enter the morph ball and you go to those sections specifically, it's emphasizing the puzzle aspect of the game. So of course, that is right up my alley. There's different upgrades you can get for the morph ball, and the puzzles then are gonna become even more complex and even harder. Uh, just so many great times solving it with my brother or doing it on my own. This was a game, actually, one of the first games I remember that I set out to beat and to complete 100%, and I did it. And I was so ecstatic that I beat Metroid Prime as a kid, as a teenager, on my own, 100%. So Metroid Prime, phenomenal game, easily my favorite Metroid in the entire series, easily my favorite Metroid in a little Prime trilogy so far. We'll see if that changes when Metroid Prime 4 comes out. I'm not going to hold on to Prime as my number one slot forever. I'm going to go into Prime 4 with a very open mind and ready to just let the game blow me away. And I hope it does. It's a game with so many little inside jokes in my family. My, my brother still uses terms from the game to describe different things and to come up with different nicknames for people and creatures. So, Prime, uh, if you have to find some way to play this game, even if it's the GameCube version, like I said, it will blow you away with the environments and the exploration. You're gonna love it. Next, at number 14, Super Mario Maker 2. And this is here kind of to encompass what the Mario series, the platformers are as a whole. All of the 2D platforms, not the 3D ones. Mario Maker 2 is basically a kid's dream or an adult with a very creative mind, <laughs> uh, one of their dreams as well. The amount of things that you could do here in the game, I've spent so many hours just making levels. Actually, when I had my first little collection of Switch games and I was watching on my profile to see which ones I put the most hours in, first it was Breath of the Wild and then it was Super Mario Maker 2. And still to this day, the hours keep on going up. I think in a past video I shared how when I had a minor surgery a couple years ago, I was spending a lot of time playing Super Mario Maker 2. And at the time it was more me constructing levels and having people in mind when I made them. For my parents, I wanted to get them involved and I was making some really basic levels. For my sister, my brother, who are a little more adept at games, I could make a little more intermediate levels. And then for anyone around my level, I was making them, making them more complex, more advanced. 
But beyond that, aside from the hundreds of hours that you can spend creating levels, there's obviously playing everyone else's levels. And if you have an online membership, it's probably the best way to play this game is to be experiencing the most that way. But even if you don't have online access, there's still 100 pre-made levels as part of the base game, so you can enjoy those. And thankfully, Nintendo does throw around these seven-day online trials often enough. I think, on average, I get about two a year. There seems to be one that always appears around Christmas, and I feel like I've checked my inbox before, and I've seen another one offered to me around the summer. Maybe you get it for your birthday. Not too sure about that. But if you're patient, the point is, there are times in the year where you could play online for free. Just pay attention for those. So Super Mario Maker 2, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, it features styles from the NES games, Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, and 3. It also features the style of Super Mario World and a couple of the 3D games, the new Super Mario Bros. U and 3D World with the cat suit and all of that stuff. Each of them have different levels and different palettes of blocks and items and enemies that you could put in your levels when you're making them. Of course, one of the joys about this game is, for example, Super Mario Bros. 1 is not just limited to those blocks that appeared in the original game. No, far from it. Nintendo has gone ahead and they've retroactively added a lot of the future items. For example, different ice blocks and different enemies and things that have particular physics that were not present in the original games. So you're gonna go crazy mixing and matching. However, you must keep to one theme per level. If you start with Super Mario Bros. 1, you have to stay that way. If you switch to Super Mario Bros. or Super Mario World, then all the blocks in your level are gonna change to suit that aesthetic. And there might be some variations in the types of enemies, so you might have a Goomba change to a different type of Goomba. On screen here, I'm gonna show some of the different ideas that I've had when making levels. Of course, there's your standard go from beginning to end. It's up to you to fill those with as many secrets as you want or none at all. I'm gonna splice in Super Mario Bros. 2 here because Mario, instead of like getting hit by a cannonball, he can ride on a cannonball. Instead of not being able to interact with it beyond that, if those of, for those of you who have played Super Mario Bros. 2, you know that you can pick up enemies and you can pick up items and then you can throw them. And in the case of a bullet bill, for example, if you pick up a bullet bill and you throw it, you can change the height and the trajectory, you can send it in the other direction, and you can ride it. And you can have some really complex levels with not too many platforms, a lot of open air and easy to die, but you can make the enemies your platforms that the player has to kind of use in a puzzle way to solve how to get from A to B, B to C, etc. If you're really creative, you can use the P-Balloon from World and you can have these races and race courses and those have been a lot of fun. I've successfully made a couple where I've had two players against each other and they've had a lot of fun playing those. You can get even more creative and you can have quizzes in the game. So all of a sudden, Mario is not about platforming or racing. Now it's about spotting the difference and what mural or what mosaic has something that you have to find and then that becomes your answer and if you can put the right answer, you can progress to the next one. You know, like a game like Minecraft, if you have an idea, then you can go and execute it. If you have an idea, then you can make it come to life. And because there are 100 levels in the base game, if I ever feel like just playing a variety of Mario uh, and I don't really know if I wanna play Super Mario Bros. 3 or if I wanna go to new Super Mario Bros., I can boot up Mario Maker. I don't remember the levels, I don't have them memorized, and I can just go replay some of the 100 levels available. So Super Mario Maker 2 really has overtaken Super Mario Bros. 3 for me just because the capabilities in the game, the different ways that you can play it, and the different way that you can express your creativity. Super Mario Bros. 3, phenomenal game, but if you want a little bit of that and more, oh yeah, and you can make your own worlds too. Let me show some more footage of that. There was a free update for the game a couple years ago where you could place your levels into worlds like Super Mario World. You have different tile sets to choose from, very simple stuff, like only a few tiles per, but it's better than nothing. You could have a desert theme, you could have sky theme, grass theme, whatever, different roads to construct and different height and elevation, some doodads to decorate them, and you can upload those online as well. So it's not just getting a random assortment of people's levels. You can also play their worlds if you choose to pick that game mode. So there's a lot to be had here. I will just stress though that this game is gonna be 10 times more fun if you can play it socially, if you can play it or share it with other people. Not sure how much you can get out of it on your own. 
Next, we have one of the kings of RTSs, Age of Empires 2, and I'm going with the Definitive Edition. One thing I want to thank the developers of this game, Microsoft Studios, for is that over the years, they've only made Age of Empires 2 better. They've recognized that this is the, the title that carries their series beyond any other game. A lot of people enjoyed Mythology, a lot of people enjoyed Age of Empires 3, it was a little bit different. Age of Empires 2, since the very early days, has been the most popular in the series, and they keep on rolling with it. There is active development and support for Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. There are still expansions coming out that feature new civilizations to play, new campaigns for those civilizations, and new achievements if you're interested in those on Steam. This is a game that I started playing. Like I said, I'm sure I'm not hallucinating this, but there were free copies of this game with early Windows computers. I think it was Windows 98, and it would come pre-installed. And if you were to uninstall it, you would lose it forever. So do not do that. For years, and for so many iterations of Windows, <laughs> I would copy it to a CD, I would burn it, and then I would install Age of Empires 2 on other Windows computers. So we're talking 2000 and XP. I always had to have Age of Empires with me. Look who joined me. Actually, I don't know if he's on camera or not. Let me lift him up a little bit. Yeah, he came up to me, wanted to get a little hug. So here's Leo. Put him back down over here. Now in junior high, I'm not sure how it came about, don't know how I found out that other people had played Age of Empires, but it's not like I was really hooked on the game at the time. I was familiar with it, I'd played it a little bit, my brother liked it, my dad even played Age of Empires, that was probably the most surprising part. But all of a sudden it became a game that my friends and I played. And one friend in particular, we would always go to his house after school, we'd been doing that for years. We were playing little mini stick hockey in his basement and all kinds of things when we got a little bit older and we were playing some video games together. Age of Empires became one of them. So we would go over to this friend's house and he had a couple computers upstairs. One older, one newer, but they both worked and they both had Age of Empires. And once upon a time we even had a friend of ours bring his computer over, his desktop. And we had an Age of Empires LAN party. Would you believe that? A game that I was only familiar with, burning from computer to computer, and we had a LAN party, when at the time people were playing things like their DS and stuff like that together. But here we were, we're going back in time, we're playing a really retro, eh, maybe not too retro, but we're playing a really old school RTS. And that friend who would host people and have them over, he and I were still playing the game up until a couple years ago. Now over the years, we've of course upgraded our versions. We got back into it with Age of Empires 2013, which is called the HD Edition. That's available on Steam, pretty darn cheap. And that is basically what you remember as a kid or what you remember from the 90s. It's just enhanced a little bit to work even better. Definitive Edition, which I believe came out around 2018, 2019, is really crisp, really polished. It's the game remade, I think, but almost identically. So the graphics have really been stepped up. All of the content that you're familiar with, with the various expansions, the various civilizations, that's all there. You've also got these new training modes and these new challenge modes. And of course, if you want to play online, then that's where the healthy player base is. And it really is a healthy player base. You can always find matches. You can play 2v2. You can play with three people versus the AI. However you want to do it, however you're interested in playing, ranked, not too competitive, it's there. There's even custom games available for you too. For me, Age of Empires has always been one of my favorite RTSs just because of the ways that you can play it. Like I just alluded to, you could play it a little more casually, but more specifically, when you want to play it casually, you could just say, well, I'm just going to build a lot of walls and I'm going to sit here, and maybe you get really silly. Maybe you decide, I'm going to play a game where I make some farm designs. I'm going to play a game where I spell something out with my buildings on the minimap. I'm going to play a game where we're going to be against a really stupid AI, and we're going to make a maze with the walls, and we're going to watch them chase us through the walls, through the maze. Oh, and if you're curious about that, if you're curious about the AI, don't worry. The developers have included new, competent AI in the game, but if you choose to, you can select the older AI as well with all of its flaws and follies. It's not often that I praise developers, but really, Microsoft is doing a phenomenal job. The way that they've made so many great improvements to the game to make it modern, to make it run seamlessly and flawlessly, and also the fact that they're still working on the game and they're still giving us more content, they're fixing bugs and all that kind of stuff. Ah, before I end this section, I would really regret if I didn't talk about the map making. You guys might notice another theme now with the games that I like, with the Minecraft and the Mario Maker, and even Age of Empires, 
easily one of the best map editors in any RTS. I love getting my hands dirty on this. I love doing different environments, whether they're snowy or forest, putting in rivers, waterfalls, all kinds of different enemies and different encampments. You can go nuts here. Again, it's the kind of game where if you can imagine it, and if you're clever enough and you're smart enough to use some of the scripts and triggers, then you can probably make it happen. For me, it's a little more complicated, <laughs> and I never bothered learning about a lot of the scripts, but I still like making really pretty maps and having some new, fun, and innovative ideas. For example, what if I want to make this relic, this collectible thing that gives you passive gold income? What if I want to make it only accessible by transport ship? I can do that. And then my friend and I, and even some other people, some computers, doesn't really matter who you play it with, you're gonna have a fun time playing your custom maps as well, and other people's custom maps too. We're almost there, and this is where I've constantly been flip-flopping, but at a certain point I just said, nope, leave it. This is what your gut is telling you. This is game number 12. The next game is number 11. But this game number 12 also has been in my top 10. I think it was up until a month ago or something. And that is Elden Ring. Elden Ring, there's not too much I have to say about how good it is because everyone who's played it knows that. Even if you haven't played it, you've seen all the hype, you've seen all the accolades and all the awards pour in. You know Elden Ring is a fantastic game, and it is. Sometimes, and I've been criticized for this before, I've called it Dark Souls 4. But that's not really meant to be an insult. The thing is, it has a lot of familiarity with Dark Souls. It still plays as if it's part of that series, even though they're clearly doing their own thing with it. And there will be DLC for Elden Ring that will continue to separate it from the Dark Souls games. But if you're familiar with those, and if you know the gameplay, then it just feels like an evolution of that. Where Elden Ring really sets a name for itself is with its exploration and with traversing through the open world. FromSoft has decided to give the players a horse or a steed of some sort. They've added a little more vertical gameplay and vertical exploration with the fact that you can jump now. Now, I have a rule, and my rule is I do not want to play full price for a game. I don't care if it's the hottest game being talked about, if it's a new release, I want to wait. Now, Nintendo, they make that a little more challenging for you since they're such sticklers and they almost never drop their prices. Lately, in the last couple of years, they've done a bit better job, but still, it's marginal. Anyway, this is Elden Ring, not a Nintendo game. Elden Ring, I thought, you know what? I can probably wait for it to get a little bit cheaper. Dark Souls 3 wasn't that great for me, so yeah, I'll wait, I'll see when it's on sale. And then everybody I knew was getting Elden Ring. Everyone was lining up, everyone was pre-ordering, everyone was getting it online and having it downloaded and installed. And I think I broke one week into my wait, maybe two. I remember at the time I was really busy with work, a lot of stuff was going on, so it's not like I was gonna have an opportunity to play it right away anyway. But the moment I had downtime and I finished work on that Friday, <laughs> I just opened my wallet up and I paid full price for that game. Actually, Fanatical also had a little discount, but it seemed like the game was too expensive. Anywho, point is, I bought Elden Ring, it was really expensive, and it has been worth every dollar. Now you can find the game a little bit cheaper, probably like 30 or 35% off, I would imagine. And boy, is it worth it. You guys, it doesn't matter what kind of gamer you are, Elden Ring really is suitable for everybody. You might say, oh, I'm terrible at those kind of games. I've heard about Dark Souls especially. There's no way I could ever survive in a game like that. And maybe that's true for a game in the Dark Souls series. Maybe that's true for something like Bloodborne. If you can play Breath of the Wild, you can play Elden Ring. There's so many different ways to customize your character, so many different spells you can get, so many different weapons and armors you can equip. There are ways to make the game go from a medium or a hard experience to an easy or a medium experience. The whole game is never going to be that easy, but of course if you can get through the beginning, if you can learn a bit of the bosses and go through some of the dungeons, you will get good enough at the game, you will survive. When I last talked about Elden Ring, I talked about how I love cheesing the enemies and finding new ways to exploit the bosses and sometimes some silliness in their AI. And you can do that as well. You can look up some videos online for how to not really fight the enemies, but how to trick them or get them stuck. Go for it. Who's gonna judge you? Nobody cares. As long as you have fun doing what you're doing, then just do it. And for me, because I locked myself into a particular play style and a specific build, I didn't wanna change my build, I didn't wanna transfer my stats to anything else. I was committed to beating the game with that type of character. I guess you could say I was kind of role playing the game in a way, and I wanted to be this kind of dexterity-based cleric. 
So yeah, little did I know that Dex and Faith were probably the worst pairing you could have in the game. But later on, Faith becomes a really good stat. You just have to beat the game, unfortunately. So I'm playing my Dex, Faith, Monk, because he's not a really big guy, so he's not gonna have a lot of strength. And he is religious, he is holy, and that's why I'm using those spells. And I would just get to certain bosses, certain enemies, where I had no chance. Maybe if I grinded them for hours and hours, then yes, I could eventually master their patterns and I could learn to beat them, probably without even getting hit. But I'm also an impatient kind of guy. I don't have all the time in the world, so I'm going to find different ways to expedite the process. I'm gonna, I'm gonna look to cheese certain enemies. If I don't wanna devote two hours or four hours to them, I don't think they're worth it. I would rather embarrass them. So I don't have any of those fights captured, I don't have any of that on footage, but I do recall the exact fights where I did cheese the enemies, and boy was I proud of myself. Maybe the surprise isn't that Elden Ring is here on my list, maybe the surprise is Elden Ring is not in my top 10, especially for someone who loves Dark Souls, loves Elden Ring so much, and this game really is phenomenal, 9 out of 10 for me. What's keeping it from being 10 out of 10? What's keeping it from being in my top 10? I think it's a little bit of the lack of story, storytelling specifically. Yes. The world has a lot of lore, and yes, as you talk to the characters, and as you read the item descriptions, you're gonna learn a lot about the world, and you can immerse yourself in it that way. But I don't think in 2023, or whenever the game came out, 2022, that that's necessarily enough. It's great for the gameplay, and that's why the game is that high, and that's why I love this game. The gameplay is there, and it's undisturbed by anything else. There are no distractions. But if you wanna create a more complete experience, then you have to step up a little bit from how the NPCs present things, how the NPCs talk to you. You have to get a little more involved in the quests, and you have to give the player a little more blatant storytelling. It can't just be all subtle and all hidden. So that's really my only criticism of Elden Ring. I'm not here to trash the games that I love, I just want to make that clear, because a lot of my friends are surprised that this is not a top 10 game for me, and that's why. It's an amazing game, it's a great experience, but it's just lacking in certain areas. And I feel like with how ambitious it was and how it tried to do everything, it fell short in certain categories. That said, again, the gameplay, top notch. Now, for the final game in this video, we have Halo 3. And this is a series that I grew up with thanks to friends. I haven't opened this up in forever. I'm not even sure what's contained in here. That's always good, when a CD is just kind of, oh great. The little CD holder became unglued from the case, and so that's just floating around in here. So that's how my Halo 3 disc is being treated right now, okay. We've got a little uh, hardcover book here, not sure what this contains. This is gonna be a miniature art book? Not exactly, it's an information book. So it has some pictures and it has a lot of text describing a lot of the enemies and the races that appear in the game. It's better than nothing though, it's interesting. Of course, you've got your manual. This looks like a fold-out poster. Ah, fold-out button scheme and... Oh no, I was right. Fold-out poster there. So if you played the games from 1, 2, and 3, then you were really in love with these characters. This one in particular was one of the favorites. When I open the back of the case, I'm assuming this is an update for the game. Maybe they had to release it in two parts because there's this warning here. It also says essentials on it. So again, yeah, I'm not sure if that's containing updates or maybe it's a lot of bonus content, like behind the scenes making of the game. So that's that for what's contained there. I remember with Halo 2, one of the things that I really loved about that was watching the behind the scenes making of documentary there. I think that was included in that game's limited edition or collector's edition, whatever it would have been called. Also came in a metal case, I think that one was silver. Halo for me started as a series where I went over to a friend's house, we were just kids with the original Xbox. I did not have one, I didn't even know about the console, I don't think, but this kid had something called Halo. And it was a game where you were getting on vehicles. I remember the level we were playing was one of the early ones on the beach where you're going around the Forerunner compound. And it was just so interesting to me seeing the firefights taking place on that beach. Your character and the enemies were whipping grenades at each other. You were taking cover behind different things. Shooting looked fairly easy to get into. Kind of reminded me of Perfect Dark with the different guns that I saw on screen. And I was just hooked. I was entranced at what I was looking at. So sometime later, I can't remember exactly when, but we got our own Xbox, we got Halo, and that was it. I was a Halo fan for life. Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3. Every game that you played, the hype just continued to build. Everyone was getting more excited about where the series was going. Halo 3 ended up being the perfect conclusion of the series, or so we thought. Of course, now most of you know that Halo has continued beyond Halo 3. There's Reach, there's Halo 4. 
I think there's even Halo 5, and now there's Halo Infinite. I stopped caring about the series modern titles. I have Master Chief Collection on computer, so when I get around to it, I will play Halo 4. But for me, as far as I'm concerned, the series and my love for it is contained up until Halo 3. I'm happy with that. Halo is not the most complicated FPS, not the hardest FPS, but it delivered in so many different aspects. And number one was probably fun. It was accessible for everybody. Different game modes made it so that anyone could have a chance to win. Different vehicles and different power-ups on the ground and different weapons available. Again, kind of helped level the playing field. So even if you were a worse player, if you could get your hands on a rocket launcher, there, you had a way to equalize against somebody with better aim. If you're somebody who's just killing everybody on the ground because you've got incredible aim, you better watch out because if a lesser player gets into a vehicle, especially if it's an airborne vehicle, they might shoot you down before you have any idea what's really going on. When Xbox Live was thriving on the 360, this game was king. It reigned supreme and I wish it still would because really, this is one of the best FPS I've ever played. It hasn't been topped in so many different categories, yes, I've enjoyed the different weapons and abilities that are in Siege. And yes, I've enjoyed the fast-paced action in Call of Duty. But Halo, with the maps and with the team play, I think it's the team play in Halo that really sets it above all else. You are not going to win any game on your own. Especially if you're doing objectives, you're going to need to divide your team, you're going to need to work together. And when you're playing that kind of a thing with friends, you're playing on LAN, which I did a lot of in high school, it is just a riot. We would get together at some people's houses, we'd bring a couple Xbox 360s together, we'd chain them up, one on one TV, another on the other, you're doing split screen, four people here, four people there. So many late nights, so much mayhem, so much chaos, everybody just hooting and hollering, and just, you know, laughing at each other and doing ridiculous things. You had your better players who are kind of playing down a little bit to make it a little more fun. You had your lesser players, like I said, they're going for flags, they're going for objectives. You're trying to give them the power weapon so that they could upset somebody with a really big kill. A lot of us, not everybody, had Xbox Live, and so we'd get together after school. We'd play a little bit there. There were some really big maps. We would do 4v4 together, try to beat a group of strangers online. We would do 8v8. Yeah, seriously, eight players, 16 total in a lobby. That was mayhem back then. And we would just have some more fun with those game modes. The maps were bigger. The vehicles were a little bit sillier. There were so many more power weapons all over the place. For the making of this video, I've gone back to the Master Chief Collection and I've tried playing a little bit online there. Since you don't need Xbox Live, you just need an internet connection and own the game. And it's been pretty fun, honestly. It brings back a lot of memories. There's some stuff that I'm not familiar with. They've added some new weapons, these SMGs that are silenced. A lot of the maps I just can't remember or they're new to me as well. I uh, had a one really good game and then I got smashed in a few more, but it's fun and I have to be very careful because I could feel myself easily getting addicted to this online again. I'm never going to pursue a ranked career like I used to. I used to watch MLG play back in the day and these guys were the best of the best. Just a bunch of kids around my age or a little bit older and they're making tens of thousands of dollars for competing in Halo tournaments. I thought it was incredible. I really wanted to do it, but I never got that good. And I'm certainly letting those ambitions lie where they are. Not going to try to pursue them again. I'm happy just playing my casual modes right now. I think I'll leave the Halo talk there. You guys can probably hear the difference in my voice now, getting a little harder to speak. And that's going to wrap up this video. I'm going to close with just a few words. So that's it, everybody. That's all the games before the top 10 portion. And like I mentioned at the beginning of this series, top 10 is going to be split into two parts, five games, and then five more games. And that's mostly because when I get to the final video, I want to talk a little bit extra, and I want to include a bunch of fun things for you guys, which I'll leave as a surprise for now. You can see one of my previous takes I had to clean up. I spilled some of my tea on myself. Whoops, I'm at my limit here. I just want to say thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed how in this latest episode and the last one before it too, I'm getting into a little bit more of the storytelling. I realize I'm getting a little bit long-winded as I talk about these games as well. It's completely non-scripted. You can see I just have a list of games in front of me. At first I thought that I would be writing some points on the games. This is the last video and I left the spaces between the games. I didn't bother with anything just because I wanted to talk freely about whatever came to me. Since these are games that are important to me for the fact that I've loved them so much, they're favorites, yes, they're the best games that I've ever played, but they're favorites because of the memories that I hold. It's not just me doing reviews here. I thought, let me speak candidly. Let me go with whatever comes to mind. Let me go with the stories that I recall. I didn't want to have any scripts for these videos. so. I hope that it's been bearable for you. 
I hope that it's been enjoyable. You saw a little glimpse of Leo earlier. Of course, he's gonna make his appearance in the thumbnail. What will it be? We'll see. Of course, when you're watching this video, you already know. I think that's all I have to say. I keep dragging things out in this video, so I hope I haven't made it too long for you. I hope you'll forgive me if I have. Once again, as always, thank you all for watching. Chime in the comments with what games on the list that you remember playing, which ones are your favorites, and I will see you in the next video.